morning, John, and thank you very much for allowing me back here. It's been great, and I must admit, I actually look quite forward to doing all this. I was very apprehensive when I was looking at all the other ones, and I thought, yeah, there's some real war stories on there, but mine's not a war story. Mine's just about my life. Yeah, yeah. And, and the oaks and the like. But before I go into support, Commander, there was just a few things I forgot about in 3 Commander. Right. I saw that. And one of them was in 1973 when we were doing a lot of ops in Mozambique patrolling and things like that. And everybody was running around looking for this so-called Sikorenza base camp. And we, as a whole of three commander ones, would chop it in to do an attack on the site where the camp was supposed to be. And we had, you know, the old fixed wing provost doing the airstrike and things like that. But anyway, further to do, there was nothing there. So anyway, that day, that night, we based up in the areas and things like that. The next day, we were told to patrol in different directions, you know, 13 troop one way, 12 troop the other way, and so it went on. And with 13 troop, we had uh, support group trackers with us, which was Charlie Krauss and the Ice Brooks and things like And I can't remember who else was there, but I, I remember, I think it was just CJ Icebrook and Charlie Krauss. And we were patrolling, and it wasn't long after that we picked up a whole lot of tracks. And as I said before, when you picked up tracks in Mozambique, you always followed them because they would lead you somewhere. And we were following these tracks, and and we had the provost as a Telstar come air cover above us. And anyway, he had to return for fuel. And as he returned for fuel, he wasn't gone very long. We started coming across signs that we were getting close to a base camp. Once again, the Mopani trees were stripped of bark and, you know, grass had been cut. And you can see there was a lot of activity in the bush in it. And anyway, I was on the right flank with the tracking group plus the 13 troop command section, Dave Hopwood, Bruce Simmons in the center, and one of the other corporals on the left flank. I think it was Yanni Spain. And as I pressed this small rise, there was a big bobab down to my left. And I just happened to look at it. And next one I see this guy stand up with an SKS. And anyway, at the same time, he stood up. So the trackers saw him and opened fire. And I saw the guy go down. And anyway, all of a sudden, once again, we were in the thick of it there. And I had a 32 Zulu on my rifle, because we were always told, you know, put this on your rifle, at least fire it in the, you know, at the initial one. Anyway, I let go of this thing, and Rachis, <laughs> that thing blew up about five meters in front of me, if that. And I said, yeah, what happened? Yeah. Anyway, the shrapnel hit on Charlie Krauss in the head. So he was slightly wounded and things like that. But anyway... This fire fight continued for quite a while, and we were getting hammered eh, by these guys. And we just couldn't go anywhere. We were virtually pinned down where we were. So we were just lying down and returning fire, and they were shooting at us. And eventually they scoffed. And a couple of the other troops arrived on the scene. And lo and behold, these guys had zeroed in their base camp with their mortars. And next minute, here we are, these mortars falling in around us. And they'd gone to one of their satellite camps further on down the river and, and started mortaring their own base camp. But anyway, that was just a story I thought I'd mention. Those 32 Zulu rifle grenades were bloody unstable, weren't they? They were suspect. Eh? Oh, they were terrible things. As I said, I don't know what, what set it off. As it, went, it was about five meters off the end of my barrel when it just blew up. Do you remember uh, when, when 14 troop, when we blew up, our ammo trailer blew up? Yes, I do. We were at Jock Darwin, and, uh, and I think the 30... <laughs> you know, it wasn't years. that, I mean, even one commander's ammo trailer blew up one day. They were on their way back to, for R&R, &R and their ammo trailer blew up. Their commander ammo trailer blew up. Yeah, yeah. But whatever set it off, set it off. But anyway, nothing transpired of that, and, you know, things returned to normal. And anyway, that was in seventy. Three as such, and then I just wanted to mention seventy-five, which I forgot about, was the when the RLI was given freedom of the city of Salisbury, 
mm. in July. And that, that was quite something, eh? Because the whole RI came back for that and we did our parade and things like that. But the beauty of that was after the parade, we were allowed to go to town in our greens. And of course, you know, we swamped the pubs, hotels, bars, nightclubs, whatever, in our greens. And now you can remember, now you can just think in your mind, you know, 300 odd soldiers careering around in greens, charged with high level of testosterone. <laughs> and well, <laughs> did we go no further? As I'm sure many a young lady had the enjoyment of spending the night with an RLI soldier that night. <laughs> but that was just something. And funny enough, it was actually that particular day was my birthday. It was actually on the 25th of July in 1975. So, yeah, so consequently, I didn't even got home that night either. So it was a long, long, long day and night. And in 76, I just want to talk about an incident with bees and a fire force contact. And um, Kip Donald was KCAR commander, and 12 Troop were busy sweeping a river line. And old Mike Reynolds and company were having a few contacts. And anyway, he thrown in a grenade into a sort of a tangled area. And anyway, there was a terrorist hiding in that particular area, but also there was a huge swarm of very, very African bees in there. And anyway, According to the guys in the air, I never saw it, but they said it was just hilarious. There were just soldiers running, diving into rivers, gapping it in all directions. But the funniest part was there was four RLI soldiers legging it down the pass <laughs> with a terrorist in hot pursuit, <laughs> getting chased by the bees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was funny, and it took a bit of time for order to be restored. But that night at Mount Dawn, there was a lot of sorry looking soldiers there. And a lot of them looked like they'd gone about 12 rounds with old Mike Tyson. Because <laughs> <laughs> their faces were swollen and things like that. But yeah, it was just a bit of humor and, and things. But according to the guys in the aircraft, old, Major, old Kip Donald said it was the most funniest thing he's ever, ever seen in his life. <laughs> so it must have been quite amusing. And anyway, that is enough of those early years. There's just a few things I forgot to mention there. As I said, then in November 76, I was transferred to support commander. Arrived there, and Pat Armstrong was the OC, Pete Fondel the 2RC. And I went there as the CQMS. I joined support commander, funny enough, also in the Hondi Valley. And took over my duties as the CQ, and it wasn't long there, then we were transferred, we went to Grand Reef as Fire Force. I settled in with at Support Commando, getting myself sorted, getting all my ducks in a row, so getting familiar with the stores, getting familiar with how things ran in Support Commando, because every subunit was slightly different how it was run. You know, no, nobody was exactly the same. And basically settled in without causing too much grief and upsetting too many people. And January, February went on, and it was all just fire force ops. And anyway, in May of 77, Nigel Henson arrived. Now I knew of him from past experience when he was in two commando as a subby, and then he'd gone to the Salute Scouts. And but anyway, lo and behold, this Young Major arrives, long, long hair down to his shoulder virtually, beads around his neck, and I said, oh, hell, this should be interesting. <laughs> and anyway, always, always one's a little bit apprehensive of a new OC arriving. All right, I hadn't been very long in support commander, but let's see what happens. And Nigel was an incredible guy, a brilliant soldier. And he really changed a lot of little small things and got on and things got a, quite relaxed, I would say, a little bit to my, 
wasn't so happy about it. As I said before, I was quite a disciplinarian, but things got very, very relaxed and full pain with us. But we all fitted in and Nigel's way of thinking and the troopies and everybody just got on very well. And anyway, we were at a bit of a r and and we were having a bit of a party at somebody's house and Nigel came to me and said, listen, man, don't you want to go back into the troops as such? So I said, yeah, I said, I don't mind. He said, he said, really, I think you wasted being a CQMS. So I said, well, what's the score? He said, well, I've got a new subaltern coming by the name of Neil Jackson. He's joining the RLI from four independent company. And we're going to start, start the assault pioneers troops. So I said, well, explain more. He said, no, the assault pioneers troops is you're going to be doing engineering courses, and you're going to be trained as engineers and such. So I thought, okay, well, that sounds like a good idea. And anyway, so there I went off to start this assault pioneer troop with Neil Jackson. And sorry, also at, towards the end of May, I went on a para course. Fortunately, I did mine in Salisbury, so I was happy I didn't have to come all the way down to South Africa to do it. And Paracourse done and dusted. When we finished the Paracourse, we went, support commander was Fire Force Motoko. I went up there and then I started doing quite a few operational jumps there as Fire Force. Time went on and then towards November of 77, Operation Dingo came on the cards. And in the first phase, we were the standby Paris, and we were based at Grand Reef. I remember on the day the attack took place at Chamoya, us all sitting in our, under the deck, waiting to go, parachutes on, waiting and waiting and waiting, and eventually the guy said, no, you can take your chutes off. But anyway, we weren't called in as a reserve, and everybody knows about Optingo, and we went back to Salisbury, to take part in phase two, which is to the Tembui base camp. And this time we would definitely be involved as we were the reserves that time. And three commandos became reserves. They went to Mount Darwin and we and the SAS took part in the Tembui raid. And there was quite a long jaunt to Tembui, you know, where Chamoya was a short jaunt across the border. Ours was a long way, over Kabora Bassa Dam. And then one of the things we were told, if anything happens, it's easier for you to walk to Malawi than to walk back to Rhodesia. So that's how far we were. Sure. Yeah. And I was in stop two. So, and I remember when those guys put my chute on that early morning, they tied the strap so tight I could hardly stand. So I had to virtually walk doubled over to the deck, get in the deck. I couldn't even sit in the chair in the deck. I had to sit on the floor. And of course, when we were flying in, when we crossed over the border into Mozambique, we were, those decks were virtually hedge hopping. Eh? So it was a rather uncomfortable ride. And I must admit, when we were told to stand up and hook up, I was an extremely relieved boy, let me tell you. And going out that door to see the hunters doing their thing, and it was just, you know, and you look down and you just see these hundreds of little swastikas going in all directions. And we all landed on the ground safe and sound. And we conducted our sweeps, which took part most of the day. And oh, we had quite a few contacts with guys in trenches and picked up a lot of weaponry, 75 millimeter recoilers. And then later on the afternoon, arrived in an anti aircraft position. There was 14,5s there, 12.7s. And based during the day, I actually thought stop two, which is the, the group I was in, did extremely well. You know, we accounted for a lot of of the tours on in the campsite. And towards the end of the day, we were told to go back, sort out our parachutes, pack up, and stand by for uplift. Anyway, we were uplifted by chopper, and we we're flying back. 
And we were about halfway across Kabora Basso. And I always used to sit behind the pilot so I could see where I was going. I never sat on the opposite side. I always sat behind the pilot. And I saw that little orange light come on. And, and I knew, whoa, oh, that's a fuel warning light coming on. And here we are halfway across the dam. I said, this should be interesting. <laughs> anyway, I heard the chop and the tech. And then they started saying, and then they texted me, listen, uh, you tell the guy. Start looking out for a place to land. We need to land and we need to land quickly. I said, so, oh, yeah, here we go. So we're not going to get home today. Anyway, we finished, managed to find a, a bit of an island that was half submerged. And the guy, pilot put the chopper down. And then we had to wait for a deck to bring fuel. And, of course, the deck came along, dropped a drum of fuel, about half a drum or whatever, so at least it would float. Us guys went and fetched the drum, dragged it in, and the tech did his thing, and we took off. And by the time we landed on the train that night, and everybody knows about the train in Mozambique, it was pitch black. And we slept there that night. And then the next morning, when we were about to go, we were warned, listen, the MPs are at the Chiswiti airfield waiting for you guys to come back. So all you guys, we've got souvenirs. You better hide them. So we hid ours all on the chopper. <laughs> Eh? and waited for, to be searched and checked out and grumbled. And then when they'd gone off, we went back to the chopper and the guys picked up their souvenirs. <laughs> and they, so that was of Tembe, you know, of Dingo. And, yeah, it was quite a thing, you know. It was our first major external to be involved in in the RLI with the SAS. And, and I think all the RLI guys involved in that, particular operation yeah it always go down in memory yeah. and we did well you know for the limited resources that a decent army and air force had i think we did extremely well along came 78 and it was just you know by now the fire force scenarios were getting more and more and more and more and as i said once before now we most of the time we just never went home. Eh? It was a, a troop at a time. And then you just, the only time you saw any of the other subunits is you either passed them on the road or would, when you took over them from at Matoko or Grand Reef or Buffalo Range. You know, we were doing fire force from the top end of Rhodesia right down to the bottom end of Rhodesia. So they, the RLI was spread to its limit. You know, you can imagine in all the, the, those five or months, eight weeks at a time, 10 days back, the amount of contacts the guys were involved in. And it was, it was now starting to get quite, quite hairy as such. You know, we were starting to take a few more casualties. A few more guys are getting killed. The chopper starting to get shot at a lot. And things did definitely start getting more intense, you know, during 78. And it also, in 78, that, you know, the Viscounts were shot down. Yeah. And it was, it was July 78. I was in an op operation in Mozambique. And a little bit of background to that operation. We had our reggae troop, which was old Taffy Taylor and his crew. And they... It was a suspected camp in the Mozambique area there, and Taffy was going to do the reconnaissance, and I was going to go and lay landmines. And anyway, old Nigel Enson said, listen, you guys are getting a, you're going to go up in the links, you're going to go and do an air recce of the area, so you can see where's water and see what's going on. And off we went in the links, and we we're overflying the area where we were supposed to be going and looking and yeah, okay, water was there. And anyway, the pilot spots a vehicle on the road. So he says, you're actually ready for some fun. So he says, yeah, what fun? He says, now we're going to take on that vehicle down there. Sure. So, off he did and he into his dive and he started firing and and I looked outside the window and I just saw all this red and green stuff going past the, the aeroplane. And I said, oh, well, they're also shooting at us now. <laughs> and, yeah, so it was quite an experience. I mean, the, you know, to be flying around and all of a sudden involved in a bit of an, an air attack on a vehicle on the road. 
And anyway, all ended well, and we all flew back to Matoka. And Taki was chopped in to go and do his Ricky, and I was chopped in to do ice oh, Now, I had to walk, it was about a long walk, it was about a 30k walk that from where we were chopping into, and we, we were chopping in late in an afternoon, it was about almost five o'clock when we would drop. And we set off immediately to get as far away as possible from the drop zone. And what we did, we would walk at night and then find a layout place for the day. Anyway, it took us two days to get to where we were supposed to be. And when we got there, we were actually overlooking we on a bit of a hill, overlooking the small complex, and there was a crossroads there. And opposite us was this reentrant where there's supposed to be camp was, and I knew Taffy was in that area somewhere. And he'd done his recce and confirmed that there was things on the go there, and they called in a hunter strike. And that was also something quite spectacular to watch, because here we were virtually at the same height as the hunters, whilst they were doing the airstrike. Yeah. And there was a lot of things going on and firing and, and all sorts. And unfortunately, when Taffy was withdrawing, the two choppers that were sent to pick him up, one of the choppers flew directly over a Zandler base camp and was shot down, and the pilot and the tech were killed. Anyway, that night we were supposed to land, lay our landmines, but it was just, it was such a hub and hive of activity, it was just unreal. I just thought, there's no way we can go down there and go and lay landmines. I said, we're just going to get compromised. I mean, we're going to end up fighting with 400 oaks and there's only 12 of us. So we just stayed with you. Anyway, the next morning dawned on the radio. We get called, withdraw, get back as far as you can, stand by for uplift. And anyway, we walked back out, got picked up, and back to Matoka. And Nigel said, we're off to Kareem, off back off to Salisbury, another external. Off we went. And... Back there, but this time we were told, no, we're going to be jumping into the admin base. And once again, we will also be ambushing roads and acting as stopper groups whilst the attack on the base camp is done. And we had to fly in the DC-7 to the admin area. And on the DC-7, it was quite a few of us in that, that, that plane, plus a lady load of after drums and I can assure you flying in that DC-7 is not very comfortable. I promise you it's probably the worst flight I've ever had in my life in an airplane and it was hot in there and the guys were passing out and all that the PJI was doing he was just walking and just cutting the straps off because there was a guy keen passed out you know it was all sorts of things were just going on the guys were sick and once again, I've never been so relieved in all my life to get out of an airplane. And we all gathered out kit and old Ken Reed shouting the odds at the bottom there because he was running the admin base. And we were chopped off to our various positions. I was running one stop group. Nigel Henson was running another stop group. And he was actually on the tar road that ran from Zambia through to Mozambique and we were on a subsidiary road that joined that road. Well, Al Nigel and his group had spent two days of glorious fun there. And I remember flying in when the choppers picked us up eventually, flying over his area and at the bottom of the hill there was just a, a scrapyard of vehicles. Of all the different vehicles whether it was Frilima vehicle or civilian vehicle or whatever that ended up in the scrapyard. And we, all we did is end up planting our mines, laying our landmines and getting it out of there. And that sort of brought almost 78 to an end. And then it was November 78 when we did our Gatling. And that's when the Air Force attacked Westlands Farm. The SAS, the camp at Makushi, 
and support commander and three commander dropped into CGT2, also in Zambia. Well, we all know about the Westlands farm story with the green leader. Yeah. Right, telling the, the Lusaka um, airport control that the Rhodesians are now running air Zimbabwean, I mean Zambian airspace and the SAS, their attack on their camp was successful. But funny enough, that camp was occupied mostly by female turns, as far as I can remember. Mm -hmm. CGG2, when we got there, was vacant. And I think to myself, I must admit, I was a bit relieved because we had to sweep up a hill to their base camp. And when we were going up this hill, I mean, the trench system that we came across, and they'd left quite a lot of their equipment, i.e. there was a... Um, 75 millimeter recoilless rifle left behind. And you can see where they were doing their target practice with their 12.7s and 40. So if they were there, I think we would have had a tough time yeah. mm. because it was a very thickly wooded hill feature. And when I looked around, I didn't see much evidence of any airstrike, anything like that. And I thought, well, I think chaps, we were lucky. Yeah, we got away with it. And the next day we met up with the three commander guys and that was when one of our alouettes was shot down not far away from there that was right. flying around in an area to pick up parachutes and it was shot down and old beaver shaw has told told you about that and he's right yeah beaver talked yeah, about that he talked about that because those guys were quite badly hurt and anyway we withdrew back to radiza flew back and that was the end of 78. You wanted to talk about the unveiling of the troopy. And and the, the troopy was was unveiled by um, Corporal Phillips. Corporal Russell. Yeah. Yeah. And apparently he was the recipient of a silver cross. And the story of him, how he won that silver cross, is actually a fascinating story. Why don't you take us through that? Okay, support commander was fire force at uh, Fort Vic, and some RAR sticks that got involved with a group of terrorists, and in a hilly area where there was a cave. And when the our guys arrived on the scene, the RAR officer had been wounded and was lying sort of at the mouth, very close to the mouth of the cave and was unable to be extracted. And anyway, Russell Phillips took up the, the story and because the cave was so small, he couldn't go in there with his rifle. So he grabbed a, a pistol and set sail into the cave and proceeded to shoot and carry on and do what he had to do. And I think it was just his sheer aggressiveness. Mm. And they probably terrified the terrorists inside it, you know, so, crikey Moses, is this guy mad or something? And anyway, they were able to extract the officer who unfortunately died of his wounds on the, on the Kazbek back to Fort Vic. But Russell Phillips went in and out of that cave, I think three or four times, you know, because he'd come back out, grab more magazines for the, the pistol and go back in again. And eventually, at the end of the day, he accounted for two of the terrorists and wounded a third, and I think one other guy got away. I'm not quite sure on 100% on this on the scenario at that stage of the game. And he was consequently awarded the Silver Cross of Rhodesia, which was very befitting of a young man. And you know the big thing about him, he he was always a very humble guy. You know. And I remember Nigel always using him as his talisman because he thought, wherever Russell Phillips go, I'm safe. Because <laughs> nothing will become of me. And so it went on. So and it was his honor to unveil the troopy then. It was. I mean, it must have been a hell of an honor to, to do that, to go and unveil the troopy. And yeah, I had talked to him, and unfortunately, Russell passed away last year. 
Yeah. I I wasn't there at the unveiling of the Troopy um, um, log. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? It was, it was a very moving ceremony, wasn't it? It was. The, the whole of the oral love is brought back. And we, we didn't march in greens. We just marched in our camouflage uniforms with our stable belts. And we were all formed up around in the hollow square, you know, and it was a movie showing me the only guys that were in greens was of course the color party and the, the sentries on duty. And, you know, a lot of wreaths were laid. I mean, I, there was a lot of dignitaries from the higher ups in the army were there. And I'm sure General Walls was there. I'm almost convinced he was there that day. And yeah, it was a moving ceremony. And anyway, you know, time passed and we all dispersed back to our various areas of operation. And we went back to Grand Reef. And this is, and at that particular stage again, Ian Smith was busy talking to the internal parties in Rhodesia to try and get some form of settlement. Because we were in a bit of dire straits, as we all know. You know, we were getting the screws put on by South Africa and everywhere else to that some form of settlement must be sorted out. And whilst we were in Grand Reef that March, April of that year, I think support commander was handling sometimes two to three fire force call outs a day. And as I said once before, that because we were so large, we could split up. So we were running two fire forces at the same time, one in Inyanga and one at Grand Reef. And it was a tough time for support commander that particular trip. Um, it got so bad at one stage of the game that after one week, we'd already lost three guys. We were losing a guy a day. Sure. And I thought, nah, I enough was enough. I can't even imagine that. Anyway, I thought, no. I got hold of old Bill Blakeway in Salisbury, and I said, we need you here now. Anyway, he was there within three hours. He was at Grand Reef. And for those that knew the Padre, you know, he was a man's man. He, he did a para course. He went on fire force contacts. And he would never arrive at a subunit and try and preach to the guys. It was just his way of being there that would you know, calm the situation down. And he stayed with us about a week. And I was happy that I did that. Because, you know, things calmed down a little bit and everything sort of returned to normal. Although the fire force call us didn't return to normal. But we kept going daily and daily and daily, in and out, in and out. And whilst we were there in April, uh, support commander were flown down to Buffalo Range. We were to go and take on a logistic camp inside Mozambique and the Gaza province there, Russian front as it was called. And we had, of course, the air support of the, the cameras and the hunters. And we didn't jump in. We were actually flown in by the, the Bell helicopters or the Hueys. And after the air attack, the guys were dropped as a sweep line. I was dropped as, I don't know, forever. Oh, Nigel always thought I must have been the best top group oak out because I was forever planting landmines and doing top group positions. <laughs> so, you know, so we were, myself and my guys, we were put on a road so that in case anybody came to the, the guys' assistance in the camp, we were there to deal with that. Anyway, we spent 
pretty much of a listen to all the goings on in the camp not far away. And yeah, one lone tur came bumbling into our positions for he, to his demise. Anyway, we planted our landmines. But it must have been afterwards, later on, we heard the next day or two days later via, you know, everything was monitored via radio what was going on. And we'd actually accounted for two vehicles that were coming there the next day to see what was going on. So at least we did something. Yeah. And anyway, we flew back to Grand Reef. And we were there till May. And it was back for a short trip in R&R. &R. And then it was back to Grand Reef again. We just seemed to live continuously at Grand Reef. And oh, it used to have its fun, eh? Because, you know, during the day it was tough. But nighttime was liberty of Mtali, eh? And we would always have our trips into Mtali to go and visit a few of the pubs and get acquainted with the local ladies. So life was good, except for during the day, of course. But that's what it was all about. I mean, you take living under that sort of pressure daily. You needed something just to unwind a little bit. And you must understand, you know, all the RLI troopies and that was 18, 17, 18, 19 years old. You know, fresh out of school. Eh? Some of them, six months ago, they were still at school. Yeah. Yeah, they're in the thick of it. Yeah. Eh? And I take my hats off to those guys. You know, John, to do that day in and day out. Eh? And I used to watch as the CSM. You could see... You know, some of the boys were taking strain and and guys and I would just go to the boss and say, listen, you know, I think maybe that guy there, that guy there, maybe we should send him back to Salisbury for a while or let's just take him off ops for a week or so just to let him come back down to earth, you know, mm -hmm. because those guys did take strain. I mean, you and having two sometimes serious punch-ups in the day. Uh, it's not so much fun. It wasn't so much fun in 79. And I must admit, I'm not being selfish or anything, like, but I was quite grateful that I was then the CSM. And I thought to myself, well, I deserve to be where I am because I've done my share. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't involved in any of the fire force unless I was required or to go and do an external with the boss. Mm -hmm. And that was the only time I was ever used from then onwards. We went through the year and, of course, September 1979 arrived. And Op Uric, as everybody knows about. And once again, we were flown, we go down to Buffalo Range to take part in probably one of the biggest externals that the RLI and SAS ever took part in. And of course, we also had the South African Reckies there. We had the South African Air Force there with their Pumas and Super Fulons. So it was a massive external. And it wasn't just a day, story, it was over a period of days. On the 5th of September, we were due to fly in early, but then it was a bit of low mist and gooty. So everything was delayed a bit. But anyway, we eventually then we had to wait because uh, the tune or I'm not quite sure how many Fulima had walked into the admin area that was already established and they had to be taken care of first. And anyway, we were flowing in at the end of that. And just prior to one Commander Oaks and the SAS going to do, going to Barajem and everywhere else to go and destroy all those bridges and rail crossings during that afternoon of the 5th. But anyway, whilst that skirmish was happening at, at the admin base of the OC of one command at the time, Pete Fondell was shot in the leg. And when we arrived at the admin base, and this is what I always say that it's hard to say, but, you know, fate is fate. 
and sometimes fate can deal a cruel blow. Now, Captain Joe Deploy was had come from School of Infantry to be attached to support commander for that particular operation. And with Pete Fondell being wounded, Joe Deploy was moved to take over acting OC of one commander for the duration of the, the operation. And anyway, the one commander Oaks eventually and the SAS came back that evening and my butt was in one commander. And the reason being he, he was in one commander is because when he was due to finish his recruit course, the CSM came to me and said, would you like your brother to come and join you in support commanders? I said, no. Not with me acting as CSM here. So he said, where would you like him to go to? And Tony Edwards was the company sergeant major of one commander at the time, Merv Bramwell, guys that I knew. And I thought, no, let him go to one commander. I was a bit hesitant to send him to three commander because I thought there might be some bad vibes from some guys from years past. But <laughs> <laughs> so they might be, ah, we've got the young Brian Ensign here. Let's take some of that truck out to him that his father gave, uh, that his brother gave us, you know. So I thought, no, let's send him to one commander. So anyway, he went to one commander and he was part of the guys um, protecting the engineers when they were busy sorting their demolitions out in one of the bridges. And also on that particular day, the fifth is when we had the Bell helicopter with Dick Paxton that was shot down coming to collect the SAS Kazovac and the technician Alexander Wesson was killed. Anyway, the morning of the sixth started and you know, we were all prepared to come and say hi, you know, let's just have a quick chat. But he never Never did. And off we flew because we had to wait for them to put in a couple of airstrikes at the Mapai base town, as it was headquarters of all Tom Dick and Harry's. And so there's a bit of a delay start. Anyway, I think we left at about 10 in the morning, 11, 10, 11 in the morning. And when we were flying towards my pine, I was looking and I said, yeah, I wonder what all that black smoke is over there. And not knowing what was going on, anyway, we flew, we were dropped off in our sweep position to the south of my pie, us and the SAS. And once we'd all sorted ourselves out, we started our sweep. And it wasn't long when the SAS started having contacts with the guys in the trenches and Things weren't going their own way. It was, you know, you could hear on the radio that things were tough, you know. They, nobody had run away as everybody thought they were going to do. And it seemed like a lot of the airstrike was ineffective. And I remember once we were told to halt whilst the SAS was engaging themselves in some trench, in some trenches, you know, that at least we could keep the sweep line in a straight line instead of getting in front of each other. And I remember waiting, waiting, waiting. And then I was, in about 60 meters in front of me, I could hear guys talking. And I said to myself, I said, there's some Fredima Oaks just up in front of us. Here. Just be on them. Not sure if they're coming our way or what, but I said, be ready. And then I happened to be watching a hunter doing a, an airstrike. And then from that particular area where I heard these voices, I just saw the, the trees and the bush rattle and you know, from the muzzle blast of the anti-aircraft weapons. And I thought, okay, so that's what's in front of us. We've got to deal with an anti-aircraft weapon first. But anyway, we stayed where we were. And then Nigel called me on the radio and he said, listen, log, that smoke we saw was one of the choppers had gone down with all other one commander guys on. And, you know, we talk about premonition. And I knew then that my brother was on the chopper. Anyway, without further ado, not much happened. And we, the powers that be decided that after that particular expensive story of the loss of life, it was better that we withdraw because we weren't going anywhere. And it looked like a lot of the anti-aircraft positions had not been um, dealt with. 
they were, as I said, that one was stuck in a clump of bush that we saw or heard. And anyway, we had to withdraw. We had a, a route march of about 10 k's to get to an LZ far enough away for the pumas to come and fetch us. And I remember seeing one or two SAS guys carrying drips and bandaged up. So they'd also taken a few casualties, but fortunately nobody had been killed. Anyway, the pumas picked us up and we're flying back to the admin base. And one of the lead pumas flew over a, a Fulima armed convoy. And once again, the helicopters took a, a lot of punishment. I mean, there was just RPG-7 blasts all around. You just see that puff of black smoke and rounds going. Anyway, we eventually all got back to the admin base. And as we landed, um, where, as I said, as when I landed, I just saw Nigel. And Mervyn Bramwell coming towards me. And then, you know, basically what I'd suspected, I'd confirmed. And anyway, condolences were passed. And Nigel said, you, you're getting on the chopper, you're going back to Rhodesia now. And on that chopper was our Rick Van Molson as well, who is now acting OC1 command because unfortunately Captain Deploy, Joe Deploy, was on that same chopper. So, you know, that's how the things you are dealt with in life, you know. He wouldn't have been on that chopper if Pete Fondell hadn't been wounded. And Pete Fondell wouldn't have, wouldn't have survived vice versa if he hadn't been wounded. So that's how cruel life can be. Anyway, we flew back and Rahi's wife, we flying back. We still got shot at <laughs> by the Fredima on the way back. And anyway, we spent the night at Chip in the Pools. Next day I was on the deck back to Salisbury. And, and I had to go and try and explain to my parents that their son wouldn't be coming home anymore. Sure. There was stuff on them. And my old man never, ever recovered, though. Never. The old lady handled it a bit better, but my old man never, ever recovered from that. Yeah. But, now, that was what happened, and and all that was very well covered in... Hunt for Puma, Puma 164 by Neil Jackson and Rick Van Molson. An excellent book to read. So those who've never read it, I suggest you read it and you can read the full story there. Yeah. And Neil's no, anyway, longer, Neil's no longer with yeah, us. Yeah, and unfortunately, Neil is no longer with us, eh? Mm. And anyway, life returned back and was, of course, back to five. Horse. But anyway, Nigel decided now that him and I needed a holiday. <laughs> so we grabbed our good friend Dutch de Klerk, and fortunately, he was also no longer with us. And Big Mac used to be one of my corporals in Assault Pioneers, also recipient of the Bronze Cross at Odisha. We decided now we're going to go into the Tiger Fishing Tournament in Kariva. <laughs> and Nigel had a boat, so we were organized. So no problem to us. We grabbed a truck, loaded it with CQ stores, took a Batman with us, fridges, tents, and we went and set ourselves up there at Kariva for a bit of a break and to try and catch tiger fish. We didn't catch any fish, but we had great fun. Eh? And anyway, whilst we were there, we came back to one day and Nigel had been called, obviously, to a phone, and he came back and said, Log, pack up, we've got to go back. And I said, why, what's going on? He said, no, Major Bruce Snellgar has just been killed in a yeah. helicopter crash. And support commando is going on an op. And basically, it was going to be our mortar troop. There was a huge external op miracle going to take place. And so anyway, Nigel left and I left the other two guys behind to sort out camp. And we took off from the Landover back to Salisbury to go and start getting all our ducks in a row. To get the guys prepared to go and on this up and we didn't go as i said it was only our support commander mortars that went 
And of course, you know, Op Miracle was a huge convoy of vehicles. It was armored cars, artillery, salute scouts, you name it, everybody went. And anyway, that was sort of end of during the month of October. And then that was completed and we were all back on Fire Force Ops again and we were in the hurricane area. We hadn't been in the hurricane area for years. Eh? We spent most of our time you know, up Thrasher and down in Repulse on Fire Force. And we were based at Rushinga Airfield and we were operating that area. And then we had to move to Centenary and Mangula. So we were like spending two weeks here, two weeks there, all over the show. And once again, you know, support commanders are split up everywhere. And anyway, November came, end of November came. And we had an extremely successful bush trip that with very minor, we'd only had, we'd only lost one, one soldier with a few minor injuries to guys. But we'd accounted for an incredible amount of terrorists in that bush trip. And we used to have a, a, the funny thing with old Nigel in the KCOB, it doesn't matter how much flack you were taking on the ground, he was always very reassuring. And you know, one of the things you would you'd say, 7 9 is the stop two or Eagle one, whatever you call sign you were. And he'd come back and say, stand by. Now, you know, there might have been another stick that was talking to him that we couldn't hear on the radio. And eventually there used to be a little saying amongst us guys. Stand by. And, and we'd also standing by to stand by. And it was just a thing to sort of alleviate the, the stress of what was going on. And there'd be a giggle on the radio and, and somebody else would be chirp up. Stand by to stand by. <laughs> but... Yeah, and anyway, it was the end of November. We said goodbye to Nigel as he was posted. And I can assure you, the day he left, and it was sad because one minute he was there, the next minute he was gone. There was no goodbye, no nothing. We were heading off to Grand Reef, and I thought, yeah, but there's no OC here. And it was only Simon Carpenter and myself. I said, there's, there's no other guys here. It's just us left here. Anyway, Pete Fondell joined us again. But just a small tribute to Nigel. He was an incredible OC. The way he handled everybody, the guys on the ground, and the one thing he did in all five was context. To him, the first thing that was in mind was his soldiers. The kills of the terrorists came afterwards. He made damn sure that he did his best to look after his soldiers on the ground. And there were lots of things, i.e., you know, sweeping in the direction of away from the sun or into the sun, not sweeping up a hill, rather getting dropped by a chopper if you can on the other side of the hill instead of sweeping up the hill to where the turtles are, rather sweeping down on top of them. There were lots of things that he did. And as I said, his main aim was to look after the guys on the ground. So I would say, yes, the guys in support command are very sad to see him go. Oh. But also welcome to Pete Fondell, who was an old support commander, 2IC, OC. So it was welcome back to him. Look, and we went to um, Grand Reef. Did you, a, just on the side, um, haven't we got an interview lined up with Nigel Henson? Did you? Did well, you I hope so, eh? because because I, I just looked well, we were now, speaking about John Michael Caffin. We were talking John Michael Caffin, and I were talking the other day. Yeah, yeah. John Michael Caffin. We were speaking the other day, um, and it would be good to speak to Nigel. Yeah, yeah. No, I if, think you can, if you can get him to open up. I mean, we are Facebook friends. Um, yeah. I see he lives in Dalstrom. That's uh, right. Trout fishes all day. Do you think? Do you think that would be a worthwhile? You know, do you think that would be a worthwhile? That would be a great interview, eh, Nigel. It would be. It would be yeah, great. Price. 
I was with Don Price the other day. We were having a beer, and we were talking about the radio comms with the with the coloreds. You know, hello one. This is another one. I just rolled my Land Rover over, over. Yeah. And and how they and how they um you know there was a uh, it was um eeny meeny miny mo. How do you read my radio? No fee five four five. Yeah. Read your files with a bit of hum. You know. <laughs> Uh, those are those are those coloreds were unreal in the radio. You know those poor guys. They used to look after the bridges, and they were so stoked. They were permanently blown out of the trees with bloody worm. You know what I mean? They were finished, eh? But that's how they survived. <laughs> yeah, Nigel. You know, you know it's just Nigel, and you know Nigel and his dog Sam. When Nigel used to go off and find that dog, would go and sit at uh, where the choppers were, and he would stay there until Nigel came back, eh? Sure. And sometimes when they didn't come back at night time for some unknown reason, they'd run out of daylight, I'd have to go and fetch old Sam and bring him back and take him to Nigel's tent and put him on Nigel's bed, eh? Because he refused to, you know, he, he would stay there. At the, you know, the hot standing where the choppers were parked until Nigel got back. And you'd always see Nigel and, and old Sam going together. Nigel carrying his helmet and old Sam right behind him. Now, Nigel was good for support command. He did a lot there, you know. We had probably, each command had their own pub and things like that. And support command had the most incredible pub. Eh? We had a swimming pool and everything. We had a fantastic set up there. And as I said, then Pete Fondell arrived and off we went to Grand Reef. And then December came and the writing was on the wall, eh? All of a sudden, you know, you could hear the vibes happening. There were things happening. The Lancaster House talks were on the go. Yeah. Then the monitoring forces started to arrive. And then it was ceasefire. But we were still based in Grand Reef, and we were there till nearly February. We, we were there for about two and a half months before we went back to RLI Barracks. And when we got back to Oralite Barracks, it was now, you know, the ceasefire was in effect. All those plans to attack all the assembly points had gone out the window because somebody had blown the whistle. Life now returned to soldiers who had that done nothing for the last three years except fight a war. So what did we do with all these guys that aren't used to this? scenario, you know, because before when they used to come back to Salisbury, it was unpack kit, clean kit, disappear, return on the day, jump in your vehicle and back to the bush again after your 10-day R&R. &R. So that, you know, they had to now devise things to keep us occupied. They tried a bit of an exercise at Lake McIlwain. And then whilst the elections were taking place, the RLI was involved in patrolling the streets of Salisbury, showing that everything was still okay, that we were here. And we were patrolling the suburbs and being basically just trying to show the people that we were there, still, still there for them. Yeah, special unit. Eh? And I remember we were down in some part of Salisbury the day the election results came out. And all these guys were standing on the roads flapping their arms like roosters and crowing like roosters. And I said, yeah. Strongly. The end has arrived, yeah, and doing their thing and crowing like roosters and whatever. But when the ceasefire came into effect and because of my brother being killed, and then I'd also decided, you know, I've been doing this now for 10 and a half years. And I had the option because I signed on for 20 to resign. I just had to give a three months notice, which I did in January, February, March, yeah, at the end of January. So I had to do February, March and April. So the elections happened and we all know what happened there. And the end of April, 1980, I drove out of the RLI gate for the last time. Sure. But, before I close, there, there's a couple of tributes. 
I'd like to mention. And one of those was to the Air Force. Those guys were incredible. Those chopper pilots and techs, the Lynx pilots, especially the guys that we were involved with so much in Fire Force. You know, the pilots, the techs, we all became extremely good friends. And a lot of my good friends, we were chopper techs, were killed, you know, and I bring to mind full tubs, Henry Jarvey. Those were guys who were, we were there at the beginning of Fire Force. There were a lot of guys that unfortunately died later on, but those were the guys that they were at the beginning. And yeah, and also when we were in trouble in Mozambique, when you had a, a company of Frelima breathing down your neck, you know, the Air Force would come and drag us out the drain. And they were always most appreciated when that chopper came, when you knew you were in trouble. And they'd whisk you away. Because we were always outgunned when, in the later stages of the war when you went into Mozambique. I mean, even the SAS will tell you that. And I mean, to be chased around by two companies and there's only 10 of you on the ground, it's not fun, I can assure you. So hats off, yes, to the Blue Jobs for what they did for us. Amen. And also, you know, landing in hot LZs to pick up a wounded guy to get him back to hospital as quickly as possible. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And then my other tribute is to the ROI NCOs, the junior NCOs I'm talking about. Those stick commanders. You know, John, they were incredible. Eh? And as I said, guys were 19, 20 years old, Lance Corporals yeah. and Corporals. How they handled themselves, their troopies, it was. It was totally, totally professional. Yeah. You know, Don Price remarked about how young we were. Yeah. And we were young, the whole of the ROI. That war was fought by junior NCOs and troopies. Yeah. Okay, there were, there were lieutenants and things, but the guys on the ground, 90% of them, were lance corporals, corporals, and troopies. And they were all young. I don't think any of them were above 22 years old. Yeah. Except, to, you know, you had the National Service guys coming in. And some of those National Service soldiers excelled themselves very well, eh? In my case, I can you remember know, the, 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 guys like yeah. Kevin Taylor and Hippie Hodgson and uh, yeah. Marius Murray and, yeah. No, there's just, there's just too many guys to mention, you know, by name. So it's basically a broad thing to all those NCOs, those just corporals, lance corporals, whether I was in three commando or support commando, we're incredible guys. Yeah. Amen to that, bro. Yeah. And you know there's the same. Eh? I may not have been a hero, but I walked beside plenty of them. You know, their sacrifices will never ever be forgotten. Because there's a lot of people saying. They came in through that front gate as boys, but they left as men. And, it, you know, there was a lot of things banded about the ROI. And one of the things, our professionalism. You know, we were never defeated today eh? on the ground. Never. All I can say is how proud I was to have been part of it. And I will never, ever forget that. And to the Incredibles, we salute you. Amen. And have a saying, have a thing I would just like to mention. I'm just going to put my glasses on. Also. We were soldiers. There's no such thing as closure. For soldiers who have survived a war, they have an obligation, a sacred duty, to remember those who fell in battle beside them all. Yes, sir. It days and to bear witness to the insanity that is war. Yeah. And I say thank you. And I know all of the Rhodesia also said, thank God for the order of life. Yeah, thank you, John.
Oh, thank you, Log. Been a bit emotional today, but no. It all of us, bro. It, it it lies just beneath the surface, and uh, you brought it out today. And I mean, you lost your brother, and you paid a personal price in that war. You were in for the duration, and you have my deepest respect. And I want to thank you for a wonderful time that we shared this morning. Thank you for sharing your heart, for opening up and uh, showing us the real logs. Not the log I knew. The log I knew was like crapping on me every five, every five minutes <laughs> for being such a dickhead. But uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve with you. And I think you're... As Quentin Paris said, uh, who was also in 14 Troop with us, that uh, maybe it was your disciplinary influence that kept us alive a lot of the time. 